In this video, we'll be looking at the oxygen dissociation curve, which is, as you can see, a graph uh, that we often look at when it comes to thinking about how hemoglobin carries oxygen around the body. And uh, this graph uh, comes up quite a lot in exams, uh, specifically about how it can be changed under different situations. So therefore, in this video, we'll be looking at, uh, first of all, what is the oxygen dissociation curve, and then uh, how it would change in, in terms of the Bohr effect and in terms of comparing fetal hemoglobin and the adult hemoglobin. So let's start with the actual curve itself. So as you can see that this is the curve, it's got a sigmoid shape, so it's kind of like an S shape and that's quite often how it looks like. Uh, it's worth noting what the x-axis and the y-axis are about. So the x-axis is PO2, P stands for partial pressure, so this refers to the partial pressure of the oxygen. So you can think of it as almost like the concentration of oxygen in some sense, to make it easier. And on the y-axis, you can see that I've actually put down two different axes for it. One, it says oxygen saturation or the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. Now, in a lot of the situations, uh, in a lot of the curves that you see, uh, they will probably use the word oxygen saturation. However, it's probably easier for us to think about it as the same as the hemoglobin's affinity because it's almost like interchangeable and it's, it's easier for us, for us to actually explain some of these things if we use... Uh, the affinity as the axis. So what you need to think about is what happens when the oxygen binds. Now in my other video I actually mentioned this, uh, hemoglobin exhibits something called positive cooperativity behavior, which means that when the oxygen is bound to it, it changes the shape of the hemoglobin, increasing its affinity for oxygen, its attraction for oxygen. So this is exactly what it, what is actually showing. So at the, so we're going to start with the low at the low partial pressure and then it work our way up. So at a low partial pressure uh, of oxygen, there we say the hemoglobin is at, is at a low affinity, meaning that little of the heme group is actually bound to the oxygen molecule. And that makes sense because in the very beginning, if you're in an area with very little oxygen, then surely uh, it takes a bit of a longer time for the hemoglobin to actually bind to it. Therefore, it's just simply describing the situation. But as we increase the partial pressure of the oxygen, um, more it means more hemoglobin is actually binding the oxygen now, and that because how hemoglobin exhibits positive cooperativity, it will make it bind to more other oxygen even more easily. So therefore, you can see there is a massive increase in terms of the oxygen saturation for the hemoglobin, or you can think of it as how the hemoglobin has an exponential increase of affinity for oxygen. It wants to bind to more oxygen with a very short amount of time. And finally, when it reaches very, very high partial pressure of the oxygen, we say that actually all of the heme groups is now bound to the oxygen. So we say the hemoglobin now becomes saturated because it's completely filled with oxygen. And we can now call it an oxyhemoglobin. So you can see at the very top there, it reaches 100% saturation uh, in, in, at that point. So this graph simply shows uh, the sigma curve, the oxygen dissociation curve, meaning how the hemoglobin is showing positive cooperativity, how it binds to oxygen quicker than when you first started it. Now we're going to look at how it can actually change under different situations. So uh, the Bohr effect is uh, talk about when the oxygen dissociation curve shifts to the right. Uh, and it's in, in a nutshell, it simply means that the oxyhemoglobin can release the oxygen more readily at high um, concentrations of carbon dioxide areas. So this is simply referring to, um, there's a scientist whose name, uh, who, whose name is Bohr, and he discovered that in areas with high acidity, or when there is a high concentration of carbon dioxide, the uh, hemoglobin actually releases the oxygen uh, more easily. And if you look at this one here, I've drawn uh, the dotted line is the what we call the original oxygen dissociation curve. And you can see uh, the blue line here is when it's in an area with low uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. The red is in a high uh, area with high partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And if we think about it in terms of the application, uh, which we're going to talk a bit more later on, in terms of the importance of this, uh, an area with a low carbon dioxide partial pressure would be the lungs because that's where the carbon dioxide is actually gotten rid of. Uh, we breathe it out through the lungs. And in tissues or organs, basically anywhere else apart from the lungs would have a relatively higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide because our cells are always doing, um, doing respiration to release carbon dioxide. So that's what it is.
So when it comes to actually interpreting the, this graph, this is a, a, a really good way of doing this, right? So I'm going to use a ruler and I'm going to pick one area here. So what we're going to do is to compare the hemoglobin in the tissues and the hemoglobin in the lungs uh, under the same sort of conditions in terms of the partial pressure of the oxygen. So if we assume that in this situation here, that uh, if we're comparing two hemoglobin, two oxyhemoglobin, contains the same amount of oxygen inside, but now in two different areas, and we're going to see what happens. But as you can see, as I draw a line up there, then uh, the hemoglobin in the tissues, in this red line here, this dot is actually lower than this one. And if we refer back to this axis, which I mentioned earlier, if we think about this time in terms of the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, we can then say that the oxyhemoglobin has a lower affinity for the oxygen when in an area of high carbon dioxide concentration. Whereas an oxyhemoglobin in the area of low carbon dioxide concentration would have a higher affinity for it. Now, what does that actually mean? So we say that when uh, the oxyhemoglobin is in, in the other tissues of the organs, according to the graph, as you can see here, the hemoglobin has a lower affinity for the oxygen. And what that would mean, it can release the oxygen more readily, meaning it can release the oxygen very quickly and easily. Uh, and that makes sense because if you think about the application that all of the organs and tissues in the body actually want to get the oxygen uh, from the hemoglobin because all of the cells need uh, oxygen to do aerobic respiration. If that if this isn't true in real life, that would mean then uh, the hemoglobin may still be able to release the oxygen, but not as readily. So that would just simply mean that this whole process will be less efficient, which obviously, as you can imagine, it wouldn't be a very good thing. Whereas on the other hand, if we think about the hemoglobin when it's at the lungs, we can see on this graph that the hemoglobin has a higher affinity for the oxygen here. And what that would mean, if it's got a higher affinity, it will release the oxygen less readily. Or, if we think about this in another way, it means that the hemoglobin will want to bind to the oxygen more readily compared to releasing it. It wants to bind to it and secure it rather than letting it go. And again, that makes sense because the point of the hemoglobins in the lungs uh, is to uh, gather and bind to the oxygen that we breathed in in order to transport it around the body. And that again makes very, very perfect sense. Simply put, the Bohr effect or the Bohr shift is something that has been observed happening in the body where the hemoglobin is releasing, is more likely to release or more readily releasing oxygen when it is in an area with high concentration of carbon dioxide uh, and whereas it is more readily binding to oxygen when it's in an area with low carbon dioxide areas uh, such as the lungs versus the tissues. So now we're going to look at something slightly different. Uh, this time, a second situation is comparing the fetal hemoglobin and the adult hemoglobin. And in this case, uh, the black line here represents the normal oxygen dissociation curve, which is actually talking about the adult hemoglobin. And in this case, for the fetal hemoglobin, the whole curve shifts to the left this time. And in a nutshell, really, this sentence sim simplifies it all. Uh, the fetal hemoglobin would have a higher affinity for oxygen. So in the same way, if we look at the graph like the one before, we're going to look at the graph at one particular uh, partial pressure of oxygen, meaning that we're looking at two hemoglobin, two oxyhemoglobin, uh, both containing the same amount of oxygen to begin with. Right? So again, if I put two crosses there, you can see that the adult hemoglobin would have a lower affinity for oxygen compared to the fetal hemoglobin. When we talk about adult hemoglobin, we're talking about a human being uh, after being born. Uh, they, uh, for us, we are able to breathe. We are able to use our respiratory system to breathe in and out. But for a baby, for a fet fetus still in the mother's uterus, they are unable to breathe. They're not able to use their respiratory system yet. So therefore, any nutrients and any oxygen that they need to get will need to be uh, from the mother. So the mother is literally eating, sleeping, and breathing for herself and for the baby. 
the fetal hemoglobin needs to have a higher affinity for oxygen and that would mean that when the mother's blood travel for, to the placenta or to the uterus, the fetal hemoglobin will be able to get that oxygen, almost like competing with the mother, like get that oxygen from the mum's uh, hemoglobin to their own. So that allows them to do, to their own cells to do uh, aerobic respiration for growth. And if this, if there is not a difference in terms of the fetal and the adult hemoglobin, the fetus will not be able to get enough oxygen for growth and will obviously very easily die. And uh, as an extra information, it's quite interesting that the fetal hemoglobin actually has a slightly different structure, making it uh, having a higher affinity for oxygen. So we mentioned that the adult hemoglobin is made up of two alpha and two beta subunits, whereas the fetal hemoglobin is actually made up of two alpha and two gamma subunits. Now you don't need to know obviously uh, exactly what the structure is, um, how, how they're different, but just be aware that structure, uh, in terms of their structure, they are slightly different enabling them to have a high affinity. Then finally, as a quick recap, here we've got the oxygen dissociation curve which shows how the oxygen is uh, released from the hemoglobin at different situations or uh, taken in in some sense. Um, so at a low partial pressure of oxygen, uh, meaning in an area with little oxygen, then very little heme group uh, was bound to the oxygen to start with. But after the first one was bound to it because of positive cooperativity, then uh, more and more hemoglobin would bind to the next few oxygens even more easily. So th hence the affinity increases rapidly and not just a flat line. And finally reaching after the third subunit has bound to the hemoglobin, then um, the, because of positive cooperativity, very quickly it reaches 100% saturation uh, and we say the um, hemoglobin now becomes an oxyhemoglobin. And this is the sigma curve that shows how that works. For the Bohr shift or the Bohr effect, this is when the curve is shift to the right. And this is something that have we have observed that, happen that is happening in the body. And we say that in an area with high amounts of carbon dioxide or or, or high acidity, let's say in the organs and tissues, the hemoglobin actually have a lower affinity for the oxygen, uh, meaning it can release the oxygen more readily. So as shown in this curve here, it's got a lower affinity. And that makes sense because in tissues and organs, you kind of want the hemoglobin to release the oxygen more readily, therefore they can do aerobic respiration. Whereas on the other hand, in an area with low carbon dioxide levels, uh, like in the lungs, the hemoglobin actually has a higher affinity for oxygen, meaning that they bind to the oxygen more readily. And again, that makes sense because in the lungs, the hemoglobin is supposed to bind to the oxygen uh, quickly in order to transport them away. And that is the Bohr shift, or we call it the Bohr effect. A second situation that we'll look at the shift here is the fetal, comparing fetal hemoglobin and the adult hemoglobin where the curve shifts to the left this time. Again, it is something observed. We notice that fetal hemoglobin uh, actually has a higher affinity for oxygen than adult hemoglobin because of their structure. Um, so therefore, if you compare the two under the same conditions, the adult has a lower affinity for oxygen, meaning that it can release the oxygen more readily for the fetal hemoglobin, which has a high affinity to grab onto that oxygen release by the adult hemoglobin. And that is obviously very important because the baby, the fetus, will need to get more oxygen for growth when they are still inside the uterus. And that is the oxygen dissociation curve.